All right, hey, first time on the show. This is a real treat. We got Barrett Salee. You know all about Barrett. He's been covering the SEC for a long, long time. Now he's got somewhat of a new venture, old venture, new venture. I'll let him explain it. College football smothered and covered. One of my absolute favorites. Barrett, thank you for joining the show. It's my pleasure, Michael. I love uh, seeing what you've uh, been able to do with your career. It's been awesome to see uh, where you've gone and how you've grown. And yeah, doing college football smothered and covered used to be SEC smothered and covered in the audio form. I, I was forced to give it up in 2018, the offseason of 2018, and uh, building it back. I love doing independent things. It's a new challenge and uh, branched off not just SEC, but college football smothered and covered doing video forms as well on YouTube and Rumble. So uh, it's been cool. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, and I can't recommend my audience enough. If you love this show, you're going to love college football smothered and covered. So go subscribe now and just let's give them a taste, Barrett. This is what they're going to (laughs) get on college football smothered and covered. I'm really interested. This is perfect time, off-season, kind of debate style. Who do you have that you think will be the best quarterback in the SEC next season. And that I'm not necessarily asking you today. I'm saying try to, you know, try to look in your crystal ball late November. Who will be looking at as the guy that just had the best season among the quarterbacks in the SEC? I think it'll be Jackson Dart because so much is going to be on his shoulders, right? At Georgia, Carson Beck, you know, they they still put a lot on quarterbacks at, at Georgia. We saw, you know, obviously Stetson Bennett go to New York and Carson was sort of on the fringe, I guess, last year. Uh, But Jackson Dart, everything goes on his shoulders, right? That's what Lane likes to do. And he's been wildly successful at that. So you keep Trey Harrison. I think Ulysses Bentley gets completely overlooked. I I quench on Judkins. I don't necessarily think that's addition by subtraction, but it might make for a more harmonious locker room, which there's a lot to be said for that. And then Diggs coming in as well. But I see with all those weapons – Jackson Dart has a chance to really utilize them in a way where he hasn't really in the past um, because he's he's put a lot of Lane's put a lot of pressure on Jackson to be part of the running game. Even when Quinshawn was there, I don't think that's going to necessarily be the case. I think he's Lane trusts him more now than ever. And honestly, Michael, it would not surprise me in the least bit if Ole Miss makes the SEC championship game and makes oh, the wow. college football playoff. And if they do, then it's absolutely going to be on the heels and the arm of Jackson Dart. So I think there's there's a lot there to be excited about. Like I said, Carson, I uh, looked at the Heisman Trophy. I'd talk about the Heisman Trophy. I was going to talk about that on the show today. But, um, you know, it, Carson's the favorite, but that's not really dependent. The, the system's not necessarily dependent on the quarterback as much as, as Ole Miss is. And I tell you what, I, I don't think Tennessee is going to make the playoff. But Nikio Imaliava is going to have a big, big year, certainly closer to Hendon Hooker than he is to Joe Milton. Well, I was going to ask you, are you buying the Ole Miss playoff hype? And you, you, so you've already answered that, but I, <laughs> I, I wanted to pair it with Missouri. Are you buying, not necessarily that you're, you're guaranteeing that they'll make the playoff, but you look at their schedule, what they've got returning. I think it's fair for Missouri fans to expect 10, maybe even 11 wins, you know, if everything breaks right. And and if they win 10, 11 games, they have to be in that playoff mix, I would think. Yeah, 10 and 2 gets you in, even if you don't make the SEC championship game. I'm not ready to buy Missouri quite yet in terms of getting to the playoff. Could I think, are they a 9 and 3 team with that schedule? Yeah, I could see that. They're going to have to find a way to run the football um, close to as effectively. I think there is no doubt about that. Uh, You can get Luther Burden involved in in that aspect of the game. He's sort of been kind of involved in the rushing attack every once in a while. Uh, But you might see Eli use him in 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 a lot more expanded role. So I'm buying Missouri as a Florida Bowl team, right? As a an out, not an outback, but you know what I'm talking about. The out, what used to be the outback, the citrus, that, that kind of bowl team. Am I ready to put them in a in a uh, in a playoff? No, and and part of that reason, Michael, and and I've been thinking a lot about this is when the 12 team playoff was announced. You know, whatever it was, three uh, three years ago, whatever it was, the Big Ten was still the Big Ten. Now you have four more teams going in there, so I think in the past before that the idea of four sec teams being in 
I mean, that was obvious, right? If you're getting one fewer conference champion and the Big Ten has four new powers or three new powers and then UCLA, <laughs> the Big Ten might gobble up a spot or two more than maybe we thought when this whole format was announced. So because of that, maybe it's a little aggressive for me to buy Missouri because I think the availability of a playoff spot might be, it might not be there. You know, nine and three, I think you're, so, you were sort of on the bubble before big 10 expansion. Now I think you're probably going to be on the outside looking in. Hmm. Yeah, that's it. I mean, it's so much, so much we're going to learn this season. That's for sure. College yeah. football is changing. Uh, speaking of changing, we got new coaches in the SEC. Caleb Board at, at Bama, Mike Elko, A and M. You just did a, a video on it on uh, Elko and A and M. I, I recommend everybody go check it out. And then Jeff Levy, Mississippi State. I'm not asking you who's going to do a better job yeah. at those schools, but I what I am interested in, Bear, of those three. Who lasts the longest at their current job where they just got hired? I'm going to say Mike Elko. And I think A&M fans, I think, will be more patient with him than they were with Jimbo because Jimbo is the hot name. Elko's only been doing this for a couple of years. He's familiar with Texas A&M, obviously, from his time as an assistant. But I think A&M, the, found, the, the, the administration, the fan base, understands maybe patience is something they should probably – maybe focus on a little bit more right now. And the reason I don't say Kalen DeBoer, there are a couple, it's kind of two things. One, the expectations at Bama are much, much different, you know, than, than a and is, is 10 and two with a second round exit going to be enough? The answer is no, maybe in year one, but the answer is no. So uh, the expectations long-term, I think will escalate, Way quicker than they will at Texas A&M. I, Jeff Levy, I'm gonna, I'm not to throw him out, but I'm not, I'm not really high on Levy. But with with Alabama, the expectations go quickly; they escalate very quickly. Plus, and this is sort of the dovetail off the Ryan Grubb departure. Could could Kalen DeBoer get sick of college football? Because at Washington, you don't have those pressures, right? It's it's a, not say laid back, but it's not Bama, right? In terms of what you have to deal with off the field, whether it be administratively, you know, recruiting wise, whatever. So could they, Kalen DeBoer jump to the pros eventually? At, you know, if he gets a little sick of going ten and two and not making people happy, I'm not saying that's the case. I mean, I don't. I've talked to Kalen DeBoer once or twice. I mean, I don't know, but to me, I think we should at least consider that possibility, and. I, I just, if the pressure gets too much to him, why wouldn't you? If you could just go coach ball. Yeah, and maybe the best way to say that, Barrett, there's no Paul Feinbaum show in Washington, at least that I'm aware of. You know what? <laughs> there might be. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How about these? There's You're seeing a ton of, uh, you know, way too early preseason top 25s and there's about eight or nine SEC teams in them, but I, I'm really kind of curious about the teams that are kind of on the on the outside looking in. The, some of these may be in, in some of the top 25, but not all of them. A&M, Kentucky, Florida, and Auburn. Of those kind of fringe top 25 to 35 type teams, which who do you think will have a better season next fall? A&M, Florida, Kentucky, or Auburn? Oh, man. A and M, just because the system will be simpler, the schedule is not terrible. I mean, by SEC standards, um, and I think the lack of pressure on those players will help a lot. You know, I don't think we focus too much. We we don't focus enough on what a coach being on the hot seat does to a locker room, does to eighteen to twenty two year old young men. That's a lot, man. That's an awful lot. And they've had to deal with that more than a year, right? Because we've known Jimbo's been on the hot seat for, or was on the hot seat in December of last year, right? So I think that will help. And the other schools, I'm not buying Florida, uh, Kentucky, they're Kentucky. They're going to go eight and four, whatever. And then Auburn, I I would, here's all, what's the best way to say this? I've soured on Auburn because Hugh Freeze 
became more dedicated to Peyton Thorne, right? Can that change after spring practice? Yes. I do think there will be more quarterbacks in the portal than, in the spring than there were last year. So if he changes his dedication to Peyton Thorne, I would say Auburn. And I think that's a possibility. But I think that the combination of a new offensive system, a better offense system, uh, one that's been successful in the Big 12, and the lack of pressure on A&M's players will make A&M, I think, a much more complete team, a much more consistent team. And here's the thing. All four of those teams, well, three of those four, not, not buying Florida, three of those four teams might go eight and four, right? Mm-hmm. So I think at that point, you have to sort of judge it based on, okay, what are the expectations, where should they be? Where were they? And I think AM fans would probably be happy with an eight and four this year, the Jimbo Fisher special, not tolerable moving forward, but at least for now. Right. Well, you seem to be pretty high on Elko and, and the future of AM. One of my favorite questions to ask everybody, I'm just going to ask you too, Barrett. Who wins an SEC title first, AM or Texas? Texas. Texas, Texas, Texas. And I know I just got done, Michael. I just got done complimenting Texas A&M. And now they all hate me again, which I'm used to Texas A&M fans hating me because I was right about Jimbo Fisher. Nobody said what I said, but uh, Texas. Texas Texas might win it this year, honestly. They are so loaded. And I think before what happened this year, I think a lot of people in the SEC were like, ah, it's Texas. It'll take them a while, whatever. They beat the crap out of Alabama in the trenches. Now, it was a 10-point game. It was close. I get that. Alabama lead, led in the fourth quarter. They won the trenches in a big, big way in that game. To me, that's proof that Steve Sarkeesian has been building to this, to this transition. It wouldn't surprise me if Texas A&M wins the SEC this year. I'm not necessarily picking them. I'll probably pick Georgia. But that team is built to contend right now, and they've got the right coaching staff. So, you know, I, I think – if we're comparing them to Texas A&M, again, slow build in Aggieland because an eight and four season this year, the Jimbo special, like I say, is I think tolerable. Texas fans recognize, and I think a lot of us in the SEC recognize after what happened in week two, that this team can play. This team is ready for this. And whether it's this year or the year after that in 25, that team's, that team's legit for real. And people in the SEC should be scared. Now, that may be the same answer here, Barrett, but who, which SEC program that's not Georgia, that's not Alabama, it will be the next to win a national championship? Oh, man. See, I, I say LSU or Texas. I want to see what LSU does without Jaden this year and if they can be adequate defensively or just mediocre defensively. Don't just be <laughs> god-awful, right? Um, so... I, I, it's LSU or Texas. I, you know, I'm going to go Texas. I'm going to go Texas. Because like I said, I think Sark understands how to build that that team. They are ready to contend right away. And while it's already known that Brian Kelly can do that and other coaches can do that too, Texas is doing it with Texas players. And I think what we don't realize and maybe what gets overlooked is the state of Texas from a high school perspective is not what it was 20 years ago where it's like, you know, seven on seven nonstop. They've got dudes They've got big men who can run and who are athletic. And a lot of that has to do with the influx of just people to the state of Texas, like residents to the state of Texas. So there are more players coming out that have become, you know, stars in high school. Plus Stark understands the transfer portal. We've seen it for the last couple of years. He uses that to perfection. So um, I would say Texas outside of Alabama and Georgia uh, is the next to win a national championship. And honestly, I would put Texas above Alabama in that discussion. I think Mm -hmm. Georgia probably is the favorite to win the next national championship out of the SEC. I'd probably put Texas second. And I don't even know how to ask this, Barrett, because I, I'm not sure what fans are more concerned about moving forward, SEC championships or playoff mm-hmm. appearances and deep playoff runs. You know, maybe that's that's more what they're really looking for. So I, I was going to ask you, who do you got more confidence in, Lane Kiffin at Ole Miss or Josh Heupel at Tennessee to win an SEC title or make a deep playoff run, whatever you think fans are really after. 
who do you have more confidence in to actually accomplish that at their current school? I'd say Lane. And there are a couple reasons for that. One, he's using the transfer portal better than Tennessee and better than pretty much everybody uh, in the country. So he's made that job, uh, that place attractive, way more attractive than a lot of other teams. And I think including Tennessee, and, and that's not a knock against Tennessee, but I think you have to look at what Ole Miss is doing and think, dang, he's selling that place. He's he's selling that place very well. He doesn't have to deal with the divisions anymore. So that obviously helps. And in terms of a one-off, who would you trust more? Lane putting together a great offensive game plan or Josh Heupel. I love Josh Heupel. I think he would put together a great offensive game plan in a one-off, and that's, that's something that matters in a playoff. But I think Lane does it better. you know. So I, I think it would be almost – but it's a really interesting question because we have – what Nico Iamaliava does this, I think, does this year, I think really will define that question, right? Because – if he doesn't succeed, if he's closer to Joe Milton than he is Hendon Hooker, which I don't think is the case, but if I'm wrong, does Josh crank things up more in the transfer portal? Because Joe Milton was there before he got there. Hendon Hooker was there before he got there, right? So I think Nico's success or failures or just season in general will declare a lot about how Tennessee will move, uh, will will orchestrate that roster, build that roster moving forward. So, um, you know, Lane's already got his his foundation. He, he knows what to do. And Josh, is, obviously, Josh had a lot of success in 22, and I think we all know that. But uh, it, it, to me, it's more desirable for transfer players to go to Ole Miss right now, and I don't think that's really arguable because we've seen it, and I think he's more trustworthy than Josh Heupel in a one-off situation even though I do trust Josh Eipel to do well in that situation too. Do you think it's fair to say that uh, the pl- SEC player with the most pressure on his shoulders going into next season is Nico? <sighs> no. I think it's Florida quarterback X, whether it's Graham or DJ Lagway. I mean, mm-hmm. like we talked about with Texas A&M, players feel that pressure. Like they understand, hey – we are the ones that are going to dictate the futures of our head coach and our assistant coaches, like their financial stability, their family, you know, life, the players recognize that. And at Florida, I think we all understand Billy Napier, especially with that schedule is, is on thin ice. Right. So yeah, Nico's got a lot of pressure on his shoulders. There's no doubt about that. And you know how Tennessee fans, I mean, you grew up Tennessee as well. Uh, Bowl game hype goes a long way in Knoxville. <laughs> um, but uh, I think because of where Florida is as a program, I'm going to say Florida quarterback X, and that might that name might change midseason because things might go wrong, uh, probably has, has more uh, because Florida shouldn't be this bad. You know, Florida should not be irrelevant and an afterthought in the SEC. And it's even more of an afterthought now because you have Texas and Oklahoma coming in too. Right. And and so again, you may have already answered this, but Billy Napier or Shane Beamer, who do you think's on a, on a hotter seat or do you even think Shane Beamer is on a hot seat? Um, I I think certainly Billy Napier is, uh, I think Shane is, is on a hotter seat than, you know, maybe folks realize because, you know, a, it doesn't have the name brand value as other schools and B, you know, I think everybody sort of expects South Carolina to be good, not great, not terrible, whatever. Um, I know people around South Carolina like him, and I know that they trust him to build a competent football team. So, six and six, seven and five, I think they're they're okay with it. It's not ideal, and it certainly would put pressure on him in twenty five. But I think they'd be okay with it. But I've said consistently, you are one three and nine season away from getting fired. I don't care who you are. I don't care who you are. You know, and so a disaster there. Yeah, sure, he'll get fired. But I mean, look at Billy Napier. You know, eight and four might get him canned, depending on which eight and which four. Mm-hmm. It may also get him coach of the year with that schedule. It also, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's so awesome about Florida, right? You can watch it go up or down, and it could be like if they lose, if they get blown out by Georgia, but you know, still are a competent football team. Like, what do you do? Like, what do you do if you lose your four biggest games at Florida in embarrassing fashion? 
but those are the only four you lose. Like, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Like, I, I don't know if there is an answer to that right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's going to be wild to see. Well, Missouri, I, I think it's fair to say they, they've kind of come out of that wilderness. They're basically, they were been 500 the last several years, just won 11 games. Now Oklahoma's coming into the league that I didn't realize that these two hated each other to the level they do. So <laughs> I, I'm trying to get you in trouble here, Barrett. Who, who, do you, who has a brighter future? Moving forward in the SEC, Oklahoma under Venables or, or Missouri under Drinkwitz? Missouri. I think Missouri does. And I, I'm, I've gone back and forth with Oklahoma, man. I, I don't know about you. I've just kind of gone back and forth. Like, what can they be? We all know that Oklahoma has contended for national cha- – well, I say contended. They've at least, in theory, contended, right? But that was with a situation with Lincoln Riley where – the method worked to a point, right? They had the ceiling. Now, the national championship ceiling was way higher, but the ceiling was still pretty high, right? You don't have Lincoln. You're not bringing in superstar quarterbacks. I can't wait to see what Jackson Arnold does this year, but you aren't bringing in those Heisman caliber quarterbacks. And defensively, yeah, you've taken a step up, obviously, with Brent Venables. And sort of like we joke about LSU, you're not god-awful defensively. So that's certainly a step up from those Lincoln-Riley teams. But... Is that enough? Is that the right recipe for success in the SEC? Because if Brent Venables doesn't succeed, doesn't have that ultra dynamic offense, are those transfer quarterbacks going to want to go there? Uh, Or high school quarterbacks going to want to go there? No, they're not going to have that selling point, right? They're not going to have that ability to market that position. So I think a roundabout way to answer a question is that I think Oklahoma will probably be an average to above average uh, football team in the SEC. They might pop every once every every year or so. What's Missouri? It's kind of the same thing, right? But Oklahoma's expectations are way different than Missouri's. Like, look, I I know Missouri fans want to win national championships. I, I get that. I can't imagine them actually doing it. And I think fans, if you catch them at an honest moment, probably feel the same way. Oklahoma's administration's coming in thinking they're not only going to win the SEC, they're going to go to the playoff, they're going to win a national championship. And I just don't see that. Mm -hmm. All right, final thing for you, Barrett. Really appreciate your time. What game next season on the SEC schedule are you most looking forward to? And it just just personally, you know, it could be any game. It doesn't have to be you know, the high profile ones, but uh, I'm just kind of curious which, if there's one game Barrett Slee's got to watch next season in the SEC, what is that one game? Look at the easy answer is Georgia, Alabama in September for obvious, like I don't, we don't need to go deep into that. It's not, it's Texas, Texas A&M. I would pay. I hope I get to cover it. I hope I get, I hope that that's the one. (laughs) Think about how awesome that game's going to be. The buildup, the hype. I don't care if if both of those teams suck. Think about how (laughs) awesome it would be to have that game back for the first time since 2011, knowing that the last time they played, Texas won on a walk-off, sending Texas A&M to the SEC uh, with their tail tucked between their legs. I cannot wait for that game. I, again, I don't care what the records are. You know, Georgia, Alabama has national championship, can, uh, you know, uh, you know, ramifications. Kalen DeBoer, first big game. Well, second big game because they you know, have the out-of-conference game. But it's good. It's great. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be wonderful. The I care. And look, I think in playoff era, and we probably will be the case in the 12-team era, everything's been focused on the playoff, Right. Everything. And I hate that because there are so many other good stories around college football that get kind of lost in the wash. Alabama, Georgia has that. And they have the Kalen DeBoer factor. A&M in Texas has so much more. And I think when all is said and done, if I had to go to one game, it would be that one. Yeah. I mean, with Texas and Oklahoma coming in, I mean, there's going to be so many fun games, but there is no wrong answer to that question. But that's the right answer. In my opinion, <laughs> Texas at Texas a and Can't wait for it. Barrett, before you go, tell my audience, how can they follow you? How can they subscribe to College Football Smothering Covered? Yeah, it's on basically every outlet you can possibly think of. YouTube, Rumble, the video side's doing great. And then Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, you know, Amazon, all the spot, uh, the podcast locations, we are there. It's been a lot of fun. We are 10 episodes in right now and uh, really, really appreciate the uh, the support. And uh, look, Michael, like I said, when you were on my show, uh, 
I want to be part of this ecosystem. We're we're not n- none of us are competitors, right? Whether it's you, whether it's Josh, whether it's the on three folks, cover three, we're all in this to bring college football to the fans 24-7, 365. And I think the beauty of the mediums that all of us are on is that you know, you it'd be great to watch us live, listen live. You don't have to. It's just gonna show up in your phone and you scroll through and you listen to what you want, want to listen to. So um, you know, it's a lot of fun. It's a challenge going independent, but uh, I'm really excited about it. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate it, Barrett. I'll cut it right there.